Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Carol Sinek Schmidt, and uh, I'm part of the Historical Commission. And today we have David Walter. And David, I asked him about a little background on him. His career was in accounting and finance, but he's been a history buff since the junior high school. And so when he retired, he got into the history um, projects. He became a member of the Sons of Union Veterans of Civil War, the Brandywine Valley Civil War Roundtable, Westchester Railroad Heritage Association, and he's founder and commissioner of West Town Township Historical Commission. And he's written a number of articles and publications. There's information about his book. He's out of them right now, but you can order them on Amazon from uh, with the information there. So, with that, I will in ask Dave to tell us all about the obscure presidents. Okay. Thank you for in inviting me here today, and thank you folks for coming out on a beautiful autumn Sunday. I especially want to thank the Phillies for taking care of their business yesterday and not, not this afternoon. Uh, first, I want to apologize. This was supposed to be a PowerPoint presentation, and due to technical difficulties, it's not so, but we're going to do it with the overhead slides. and. It'll be more of a lecture, I guess, than I anticipated, but I hope you enjoy it. Uh, we're talking about a 25-year period before the American Civil War, and there were a number of obscure presidents during that period of time. From 1830 to 1861 was a time of great progress for America. Uh, first, we achieved manifest destiny. Texas became a republic and was an annexed as a state. The uh, Mexican War added vast territories. It was, it was even larger than the Louisiana Purchase. Colorado, uh, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, California, all became part of the United States during the Mexican War. Um, and also, during those that period of time, the Oregon Trail, the Santa Fe Trail, and the Mormon Trail were all developed. Tens of thousands of Americans moved westward all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And certainly everybody knows about the, the gold rush in 1849. Uh, transportation. In, in 1830, there were less than 30 miles of railroads in the United States. By 1860, there were 30,000 miles of railroads in the United States. Uh, in communication, the telegraph was uh, first established in 1845. By 1860, there were 50,000 miles of telegraph wire in the United States. Uh, you remember when the Pony Express was started in 1860, it took 10 days to go from the Missouri to California. Once the telegraph was in, it was practically instantaneous. Uh, let's look at industrialization. In, um, from 1830 to 1860, the gross domestic product per person went up 50 percent. The population in 1830 was 13 million. In 1860, it was 31 and a half million. And international trade exploded during this period of time. Um, from uh, 1837 to 1860, the imports and exports in the United States increased by 207%. So this was a period of time where America really took off and became the, much of the country we know today. Here's where you have to bear with me. There's a list of the, the presidents. Well, why were they so obscure? This was a great uh, period of time for the United States, a period of growth. 
There were eight presidents in 24 years. That's never happened since. Two of them died in office, and only one ran for re-election, and he was defeated. You have to remember the office of the president in those days was much less powerful than it is today. We, we have what you might call an imperial presidency today. In those days, you were pretty obscure just being president. You could walk down the muddy streets of Washington and hardly be recognized except by office seekers. Uh, and in those days, the U.S. Senate had the stars of politics. Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, John C. Calhoun, Stephen Douglas, to name a few. What you'll find as we go through these eight presidents is that most of them had more executive and legislative experience than many of our recent presidents do. So they had the experience, they had a growing America, yet none of them had a solution to the problem of slavery. So there's, there's the eight uh, presidents we're going to talk about. Each one of them probably could be a good hour lecture. I'll take five minutes on each or so. Um, you probably learned the, their names back in eighth grade. You had to memorize all the presidents in order. Uh, there was a far fewer than there are today. When I was in eighth grade, but Probably when the bell rang and the test was over, you forgot about these eight guys. You remember everybody up to Jackson, and then, you, of course, you remember our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln. Here's the, here's the first one we're going to talk about. Can you see that? Martin Van Buren. I can't say anything bad about him because he and I share a distant ancestor back in New Amsterdam. So he's my distant cousin. But anyway, he was born 1782 in Kinderhook, New York, and he died in Kinderhook in 1862 at age 80. Uh, his cause of death was bronchial asthma and heart failure. He was the first president born in the United States of America. All the previous presidents were born when we were part of the British colonies. He was the first and the only president whose first language was not English. He spoke Dutch when he was a kid. Uh, he married a woman named Hannah Gies. Uh, they had five sons. Uh, he was a lawyer and a politician. And this gets into his experience that I was mentioning. He was a member of the New York Senate. He was a member of the United States Senate. He was governor of New York. He was secretary of state. He was minister to the United Kingdom. And he was Jackson's second vice president for four years. Van Buren uh, was the brains behind organizing the Democratic Party. Jackson gets the credit. The guy who actually put it together, nuts and bolts, was Martin Van Buren. And uh, in the election of 1836, he won with 51% of the vote, principally because the Whigs ran four different candidates and split their vote four different ways. Now, what did Van Buren accomplish in office? Um, these are the things we forget about, but boy, the lighting here is like Washington. My eyesight is, is, uh, is not as good as it used to be. First was the Panic of 1837. It was a five-year depression. Uh, it started uh, within weeks of Van Buren taking office and lasted through his whole four years. What happened was the Jackson had closed the Bank of the United States, and from then on, all banking transactions were through state banks, and they started issuing paper currency, inflating the currency. Geez, where have we heard that? And uh, eventually, they couldn't redeem the paper for gold and silver, so they started failing left and right. Van Buren's solution was something called the independent treasury, but he he proposed it, but it wasn't uh, uh, installed until 1846. And that was a scheme where uh, all the treasury money would go into treasury banks rather than state banks. Under Van Buren, we had the uh, Amistad affair, where the 
uh, slaves captured a Spanish ship, sailed it into U.S. port, and said that they were free. And Spain says, no, you got to, we own you. You've got to come back. Uh, Van Buren and the Attorney General of the United States took the side of Spain. John Quincy Adams took the side of the slaves. John Quincy Adams won, and they were freed. Um, under uh, Van Buren, Texas became a republic, and they applied to become a, a state. It didn't happen because Van Buren and others opposed it. They didn't want another slave state in the Union. He wasn't opposed to slavery, but he didn't want to get involved in the, the whole controversy. Uh, one of the sad things he did was he, and after Jackson, sent 20,000 Cherokees from the Carolinas and Georgia and Alabama on the Trail of Tears, 20,000 of them. Plus, he wanted to remove the Seminoles. Uh, thankfully, most of them escaped into the marshes and swamps, but uh, Van Buren certainly gets no, no uh, credit from anybody uh, on this regard. Um, and the Mormons. The Mormons in Missouri, 20,000 of them, were faced by um, extermination. The governor of Missouri wanted to exterminate the Mormons, and uh, Smith asked for uh, protection from Van Buren, and he didn't give it to him. And of course, we know the Mormons then moved to Utah. As post-presidency, um, he ran. He's the one who ran for re-election, uh, but he lost to William Henry Harrison. And again, in eight, 1848, he decided to run, and uh, he ran as a the candidate of the Free Soil Party, which was an anti-slavery party at that time. Uh, he got 10% of the vote. And he, uh, when the war came, he did live till the Civil War. Let me, oh, I, should, I need to type larger. He, he supported the Union and Lincoln when the war came. So after Van Buren, William Henry Harrison. Uh, he was born in Charles uh, City County, Virginia. His parents were wealthy planters. They had come here right after the founding of Jamestown. He lived until 1841 when he died in Washington of pneumonia and cholera. Um, we all hear how he stayed out in the, the rain and got pneumonia. They think it was cholera from the tainted White House water. His spouse was uh, Anna Summers or Sims of Ohio, and they had ten children. He was educated as a Presbyterian uh, at a Presbyterian college in Virginia, and he went to the University of Pennsylvania Medical School, where he boarded with Robert Morris and studied under Dr. Benjamin Rush. But his father died, and he abandoned his medical studies, and he joined the army. He became an aide de camp to uh, General Anthony Wayne at the Battle of Fallen Timbers. Uh, he was then appointed the first congressman from the Northwest Territory. Then he was appointed by President Adams as the first governor of Indiana Territory. Uh, being a military man, he got involved in the uh, Army again, and he was the one who defeated Tecumseh's Indian Alliance at the Battle of Tippecanoe, and that's where he gets his sobriquet, Tippecanoe. In the War of 1812, he led the Army of the Northwest to victories at Detroit and the Battle of the Thames in Canada. He then became an Ohio politician, again serving in Congress and, uh, and the U.S. Senate, and he was the ambassador to, to Columbia. In uh, 1840, he was nominated over the more controversial Whigs, Webster and Clay. He ran, of course, as a war hero and against uh, Van Ruin, or Van Buren. Uh, the slogan, as you all know, was Tippecanoe and Tyler too. And he's, he's come down in history as somewhat of a backwoods hick, when in fact he was a very educated and cultured man. 
So he was in office for, as you all remember, about 30 days. Well, what did he accomplish? Well, he, he gave the longest inauguration speech in uh, American history, which was two hours. He insisted on riding horseback in the cold, um, and he wore no overcoat or hat. Um, 30 days as president. But he appointed Daniel Webster as Secretary of State, which infuriated Henry Clay, a fellow Whig, and it set off two factions in the Whig party that eventually led to their, their demise. Um, he was besieged at the White House in his first 30 days by office seekers, but he moved ahead with patronage reforms and restrictions on government officials' electioneering, which we still supposedly have today. Uh, he called a special session of Congress to deal with the federal government being broke. Um, he died probably of cholera from the tainted White House water supply. And uh, he, his uh, vice president, Taylor, or I'm sorry, Tyler, um, he took Article II succession clause to mean that he was now the actual president and not just the vice president acting as president. And that's remained the precedent uh, seven more times in US history. So John Tyler, after 30 days, finds himself as president. Uh, one of those coincidences in history, he was born in the same county as the man he replaced. He was born in Charles City County, Virginia. He died in 1862 in, in Richmond of a stroke. He was a good Confederate by then. His spouse was Letitia Christian. Um, they had 15 children, which is more than any other US president has ever had. Educated at William and Mary. He was a lawyer, a politician, and a planter. Again, experience, US Congress for five years, governor of Virginia for a couple of years, US senator for nine years. He started out as a Democrat, but he broke with uh, them, thinking that Jackson was too much against states' rights. So he joined the Whig Party and was elected vice president on Harrison's ticket. Now, what did he accomplish in his almost four years? Uh, he was the first president to have a veto overridden. And it was a minor bill about revenue cutters. Every other president before him who had a uh, had vetoed something, the veto stood. He immediately got into fights with fellow Whig Henry Clay over tariffs and a national bank, and he vetoed several national bank bills. Clay and the cabinet demanded his resignation, but a bill of impeachment failed. So he was the first president they tried to impeach. Uh, all this got him expelled from the Whig party, which killed his chances for re-election. Uh, they dubbed him his accidency. During his term, the Webster-Ashburton Treaty was uh, signed, which resolved the border between the United States and Canada from Maine to the Great Lakes. Uh, he was heartily in favor of Manifest Destiny. He, he actually signed the bill to uh, annex the Texas Republic. He applied the Monroe Doctrine to Hawaii, telling Britain to stop interfering there. If you remember, it was, it was Cook that, that discovered Hawaii, but he, he took uh, the Monroe Doctrine, he applied it to Hawaii, and it fell under US control. And we know that in 1960, Hawaii did become a US state. And he was the first president who actually rode with his successor to uh, the Capitol for the inauguration. He is replaced by James K. Polk. Polk was born in uh, Pineville, North Carolina in 1795, and he died in Nashville in 1849, also of cholera. Uh, sometimes I wonder how anybody ever survived in those days. <laughs> I guess they drank a lot of beer and uh, rum and bourbon. Um, he was educated at the University of North Carolina. 
He was a lawyer. In his very first case, he had to defend his father, who had been arrested because of a bar fight. His uh, spouse was Sarah Childress, and he, they ended up childless. He's, he had no, uh, no children. His experience, U.S. House, for uh, 15 years, and he was Speaker of the House for, from 1835 to 1839. He then became Governor of Tennessee. He was a protege of Andrew Jackson. He was young Hickory. Um, on the ninth ballot, he beat uh, Van Buren, and uh, he was the first dark horse uh, candidate for a nomination. He then went on to defeat Henry Clay and the Whigs in 1844. He took the Deep South, the Midwest, and the Mid-Atlantic states. Um, this was an election where both Clay and Polk were slaveholders at the time they were, were running for office. What did Polk accomplish? Well, he resolved the uh, Oregon Territory question uh, with Britain, the 49th parallel, except for Vancouver Island became uh, the boundary between Canada, British Canada, and the United States. Under him, he prosecuted the Mexican-American War. Um, Texas became the 28th state in December of 1845. Mexico broke off relations with the United States. Um, was the border the Rio Grande River or the Nueces River? Uh, of course, the Texans wanted the Rio Grande. General Santa Ana uh, was, was beaten by um, Zachary Taylor in northern Mexico and by Winfield Scott, uh, who took Mexico City. And, uh, the war was opposed by Clay and a young congressman named Abraham Lincoln. For $15 million, the United States got vast new territories, California, Utah, Nevada, parts of Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona. It essentially completed the U.S. from coast to coast. And finally, they established the independent treasury system where all federal funds would be kept in the treasury and, and not in a bank. And that lasted until 1913 with the creation of the Federal Reserve Banks. Um, he also uh, was involved in the Walker Tariff Bill, which lowered U.S. tariffs, was, uh, was passed on a vice presidential tiebreaker. We've had a few of those. And trade boomed with Great Britain. Under Polk, gold was discovered in California. And he celebrated this as a... Uh, validation of um, expansionist policy. He created the Department of Interior on his last day in office. And it was Polk's wife who insisted on Hail to the Chief uh, being played upon the entrance of the president to any room. Uh, it actually goes back to 1815, and it was played, I think, on Washington's birthday or something. But uh, it wasn't a standard uh, greeting to the president until Polk, Polk's wife insisted that it gave him more gravitas. So Polk finishes his one term. And we get war hero, Zachary Taylor. He was born in Orange County, Virginia, another one of the uh, Virginia presidents. He was kin to the Lee family and to William Brewster of the Mayflower. He died in uh, 1850 in Washington of stomach disease, probably cholera or, or typhoid. And there's rumors that he was assassinated. And in uh, 2014, um, they exhumed his body and they examined the tissue and they found no evidence of arsenic, lead, or mercury. So he probably was not assassinated. He married um, a woman named Margaret Smith. They had six children. One of his uh, daughters married Jefferson Davis, and one of his sons was a Confederate general. He grew up in Kentucky. He had a hit-and-miss education. His 
So he decided to join the uh, U.S. Army. In the course of his Army career, he commanded Fort Knox in Kentucky. He got continual promotions throughout the Black Hawk War, the War of 1812, the Second Seminole War, and he earned the nickname Old Rough and Ready. Every general, no matter how old or young he was, had an old something as his, his nickname. <laughs> During the Mexican-American War, he was Major General, and he won the victories in northern Mexico in 1846. And he was hailed as a war hero when he returned to New Orleans. He was courted by both the Whigs and the Democrats to run for president. Um, he kept his uh, views very ambiguous, which is sort of what I think Dwight Eisenhower did in 1952, though he did oppose the extension of slavery. He beat out Clay and Winfield Scott for the Whig nomination and then won the presidency over uh, Maine Senator Lewis Cass uh, when Van Buren and his Free Soil Party came in and split the Democratic vote. Now, he was the last Whig elected president. He ignored the Whig platform of New National Bank, and he increased the tariffs again. He was the last president to own slaves while he was in office. He expressed a deference to the will of Congress and called for a sectional compromise. So he was not a pen and pencil guy where he's going to write executive orders. Um, he got involved in the Mexican session debate, which supported the admission of California and New Mexico as free states, Utah, Nevada, Colorado, and Arizona as federal territories. Um, this outraged the pro-slavery elements in the United States. He also promoted the Clayton Bulwar Treaty of 1850. The U.S. and Britain agreed that neither nation will control any canal built across uh, Nicaragua. And this was the beginning, really, of a long uh, friendship with Britain that lasts right up till today. He died in office while Clay and Webster were trying to have the Compromise of 1850 adopted. And that would have included a Fugitive Slave Act and admitted California and New Mexico as, as free states. So he, he dies in office and is replaced by Millard Fillmore. Fillmore was born in 1800 in Cayuga County, New York. And he, he actually was born in a log cabin. <laughs> He died in Buffalo in 1874 of a stroke. He, his wife was Abigail Powers. They had only two children. Um, he apprenticed as a cloth maker, and he hated it. So he got into teaching at uh, rural schools. He studied law. He passed the New York bar, and uh, he became a small town lawyer. He, he joined the anti-Mason party and supported John Quincy Adams for president uh, over Andrew Jackson. His experiences, he served in the New York Assembly. He was one of his successful bills as an assemblyman abolished debtor's prison in New York. That's a nice accomplishment. He was elected to Congress in 1832, and he helped uh, found the Whig Party. He was re-elected to Congress in 1837. He was chairman of Ways and Means Committee. He was highly respected for his performance in office. He retired to Buffalo in 1843, uh, actually to make some money. I guess in those days you couldn't make as much in Congress as you can today. But he goes back to Buffalo, and he did not seek the uh, Whig vice presidential nomination in 1844. Um, and he, he unsuccessfully sought a nomination as governor of New York. But he received the Whig nomination for vice president in 1848 to balance out the ticket with Zachary Taylor. Taylor was a hero of the Mexican War, and Fillmore had opposed it. But they had a, a ticket for um, geographic balance. And sure enough, 
because Fillmore was on the ticket. They won New York State narrowly, and the, the uh, Taylor Fillmore ticket won the presidency. Uh, this is a strange thing I found. He, he went to uh, Great Britain in 1856, and he met with Queen Victoria and Prince, um, Prince Albert. And if you know anything about Victoria, she was head over heels in love with Prince Albert. Yet, supposedly, she said, he was the handsomest man she'd ever seen. I'm not Queen Victoria, so I can't come. <laughs> so while he's in office for his three years, um, they passed the Compromise of 1850, and Fillmore urged uh, Northerners to back it rather than increase sectional uh, pressures. California got admitted as a state, while the question of slavery and in Utah and New Mexico territories was tabled. He was involved in the Fugitive Slave Act. Fillmore signed the bill after being assured it was constitutional. It further inflamed the northern branch of the Whigs. He's the one who opened trade with Japan. He sent Commodore Perry to Japan in 1853. He also backed down French Emperor Napoleon III, who tried to annex Hawaii. He avoided war with Spain over Cuba. There were many Southerners, um, and they were called filibusters, who um, would organize parties of armed men to go to, to Cuba and try to overthrow the Spanish government. And they wanted uh, to bring Cuba into the orbit of the United States and make it another slave state. He, uh, he opposed that. He was the last Whig president. The party could not survive the slavery issue. In 1856, Fillmore ran as candidate of the Know Nothing Party. He got 21% of the vote, and he doomed Whig candidate Winfield Scott. During the war, he supported Lincoln in the cause of the Union, but in 1864, he backed uh, George McClellan, believing that the southern states would return to the Union if slavery was guaranteed. That was filibusters in Cuba. Apparently the word filibuster goes back to way before that. It was guys, armed guys that would go in and try to overthrow whatever. It didn't mean what it means today. So Fillmore is succeeded by this man, Franklin Pierce, uh, another northerner. He was born in uh, Hillsborough, New Hampshire, and he died in 1869 in Concord, New Hampshire, of cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, he married a woman named Jane, Jane Appleton, they had three children, all of whom died in childhood. Um, he was educated at Bowdoin and uh, Northampton Law School. Uh, he came from a political family. His father, uh, Benjamin, had been governor of New Hampshire, and they were active supporters of uh, Andrew Jackson. His political offices were New Hampshire House, the U.S. House of Representatives, and the U.S. Senate. He retired uh, because in those days, you'll remember the state legislator appointed a senator, and New Hampshire had a term limit. You could only serve one six-year term as Senate, so he went back to um, New Hampshire. Uh, during the Mexican War, he, uh, he was asked to be Polk's attorney general, but he joined the Army and was a brigadier general of volunteers he participated in the battles leading to the capture of Mexico City. Um, at the Democratic Convention of 1852, Pierce got zero votes on the first 35 
ballots. Then Buchanan's forces threw some support to him, hoping to draw off votes from the, the other candidates. Well, lo and behold, it backfired, and Pierce won on the 49th ballot. 49 ballots. Um, his wife fainted upon hearing the news of his nomination. <laughs> Uh, Pierce won 242 electoral votes against the Whig candidate, Winfield Scott's 42, with only 51% of the vote. The third party, Free Soilers, got 5% with Senator Hale, a fellow New Hampshireite. In January of 1853, before becoming president, remember it was March in those days, uh, the Pierce family was in a train wreck near Boston and their 11-year-old son, uh, Benny, was crushed to death. The Pierces were severely depressed thereafter, and Jane refused to accompany uh, Pierce to Washington as First Lady. She stayed home and was basically a, a wreck the rest of her life. What did Pierce accomplish in office? He had no vice president. His vice president, William King, died a month after the inauguration. Um, and of course, before that, there was no vice president either when Fillmore moved up. For, for seven years, essentially, the United States had no vice president. Um, there was no provision until 1965, after Kennedy's assassination, uh, for appointing a vice president when the vice president moves up. They probably didn't miss having a vice president, but anyway. Um, he was inundated with office seekers and appointments. The Northern Papers accused Pierce of, of appointing pro-secession uh, slavers, and the Southern Papers uh, accused him of appointing radical abolitionists. Under him, there was uh, internal improvements were undertaken. Um, he had Davis, Jefferson Davis, survey three different routes for a transcontinental railroad to California. Uh, he started the Washington Monument, and he started the expansion of the U.S. Capitol. Uh, until this time, Democrats had, had opposed uh, funding of internal improvements. Under him, we, the U.S. Uh, completed the Gadsden Purchase for, for $10 million. Um, Santa Ana needed cash, and he uh, accepted $10 million for uh, what became the southern parts of Arizona, New Mexico, and I believe a little piece of California. Under Pierce was the Kansas-Nebraska Act. This divided the Nebraska Territory into two states, Nebraska, which was free, and Kansas could decide for itself whether it wanted to be free or, or slave. Um, Pro-slavery pro -slavery Missourians flooded the state and uh, voted to make it a slave state. Uh, the free staters set up a shadow government in Topeka Pierce sent in federal troops to quell the to Topeka Rebellion. Uh, the result, of course, was bleeding Kansas, where gangs uh, on both sides committed all sorts of outrages. He was the only uh, president actively campaigning for renomination to be rejected by his party. In all the history of the United States, he's the only sitting president who was not renominated if he wanted to be. Buchanan had engineered a, a deal with, with Stephen Douglas. Uh, in 1860, the Democrats fractured. Uh, Pierce supported Breckinridge as the best hope to avoid uh, secession. Uh, during the war, he supported the Union, but offered, uh, but, but vilified Lincoln in a July 1863 speech. When Lincoln was assassinated, mobs surrounded the Pierce House in New Hampshire, and he had to be uh, rescued. Um, 
And he also, while he was still alive, supported leniency for uh, Jefferson Davis. Um, the motto or the, the saying about him was, he was the hero of many a well-fought bottle. Um, he was a heavy drinker, and as I said, he died of cirrhosis of the liver. And we come to our last obscure president, probably not as obscure to us because of his origins. He was born, uh, James Buchanan was born in Franklin County, Pennsylvania, also in a log cabin. And we really have some log cabin guys here. He died in 1868 in Lancaster of respiratory failure. He was our only bachelor president of all, what, 46, 47? Uh, he was engaged to a woman named Ann Coleman in 1819. And Ann's father was a, a wealthy owner of uh, one of the uh, iron furnaces out there by Lancaster. And uh, as the story goes, he, they were engaged. And uh, he had to travel on his, his legal business. And he, he went into Philadelphia for a week or something, take depositions. And uh, he came back to, to Lancaster. And instead of immediately going to the house of Ann Coleman, he stopped off at his, his friend Jenkins' house, which was three doors down from, from Ann. And uh, he and Mrs. Jenkins, and she had a visiting sister who was probably quite good looking. And he tarried there, enjoyed refreshments or whatever before he went and saw Anne. Well, this set her off completely. You know, how dare he not come see her first? And Lancaster was a small town, and the gossips got started about, you know, maybe he had his eye on this friend's wife's sister or something. Um, Anne breaks off the engagement, and uh, she becomes an emotional wreck, and her, their family sent her to Philadelphia to live with her sister. And uh, one day she committed suicide, um, overdose of laudanum. And uh, when Buchanan heard this, he was very distraught. And, uh, but her father refused to allow him to go to her funeral. And uh, half the town considered him to be a murderer. And uh, it had quite an effect on Buchanan, too. But till the end of his life, he kept Anne's portrait in his office. And uh, just threw himself into his, into his work. Uh, so, you know, there's rumors he was our first or only gay president. Um, no way of telling. But he really carried a torch for uh, Anne Coleman. He went to Dickinson College. Um, moved to Lancaster, uh, which was Pennsylvania's capital, to, to do his legal business. In the War of 1812, he signed up with the local militia, uh, and he went to Baltimore, and he participated in the defense of Baltimore, the Star-Spangled Banner defense. He's the only president in U.S. history with military service who was not an officer. He, of course, became a politician. He, as I said, he threw himself into his work. And he might have had the most experience of any, uh, any president up to date. He was a member of the Pennsylvania House. He was a member of the US House for uh, 10 years, uh, where he switched parties from Federalist to uh, Democrat. And he was in the US Senate for 14 years. 1831 to 1845. He then became a diplomat. He was minister to Russia. He was secretary of state under Polk and Taylor. And he was minister to the United Kingdom. So he had quite an executive and legislative and foreign affairs background. Um, as I said, probably the most prepared person to be president up till then. He bought uh, his home, Wheatland, in 1848. It's still there. It's, if you haven't toured it, I recommend it. 
And he was also president of Franklin Marshall College Board of Trustees from uh, 1848 right up till his death in 1866. He was nominated in 1856 after 17 ballots, and he won with 45% in a three-way race with uh, Republican Fremont and American Party uh, Fillmore. Um, and as you know, he's the only president to be associated with Pennsylvania politics. Uh, president Biden was born here, but his political career is, is from Delaware. So let's see what Buchanan accomplished, if anything, in office. Uh, two days after he was inaugurated, the Dred Scott decision was passed down. And Buchanan had leaned on Judge uh, Greer, a fellow Pennsylvanian, to broaden the decision to say that Congress had no constitutional say over slavery in the territories. This codified it and made Southerners happy at, at the time. Um, Bleeding Kansas was going on. There was two separate factions, I said. Topeka was uh, anti-slavery, and a town called Lecompton was the capital of the pro-slavery party. Um, and Buchanan backed the Lecompton effort. Compton wanted a slave state and Topeka wanted uh, Kansas to, people in Kansas to vote. By that time they had brought in enough anti-slavers probably to win. Uh, Kansas was finally admitted to the Union in 1861 as a, a free state uh, after many Democrat senators left the, uh, the Senate. The Panic of 1857 1,400 banks failed, mostly in the north, uh, due to overspeculation. Buchanan refused bailouts, and unemployment was high for several years. Um, this is interesting. The federal deficit ballooned to $17 million. Now, that's $500 million in today's money, but it's nowhere near the $1 trillion deficit that our government's currently rack up. Uh, under Buchanan, John Brown conducted his raid in 1859. Uh, Buchanan sent Robert E. Lee to capture Brown, and he allowed Virginia to try Brown in order to pacify the South. His Secretary of War was Floyd, and Floyd was a pro-Southerner. And uh, apparently he received an anonymous letter prior to John Brown's raid, telling him what was going to happen. And uh, Lloyd's excuse for not telling anybody was that the letter claimed the raid was going to be on Harper's Ferry, Maryland, and Floyd knew Harper's Ferry was in Virginia. So this couldn't be a real letter. So he allowed John Brown's raid to, con to, uh, to take place, Probably because it would inflame the South and it would inflame, uh, it would help his side. And uh, some of you Civil War buffs know that Floyd was instrumental in moving military supplies into Confederate states so that when secession happened, uh, they were well supplied. Also under uh, Buchanan, we had the Utah War. Uh, the Mormons out in Utah Territory were in rebellion, and Buchanan sent troops, and, uh, but he also sent an olive branch to Brigham Young, and Brigham Young agreed to step down as governor, and uh, it was con the rebellion was concluded without uh, any problems. He also, well, this, this is when he died, but... but um, you know, during the Civil War, he supported the Union, and he urged that war be prosecuted with vigor. But he was hated by the North and branded as a traitor. Um, his memoirs in 1866 thought to defend his uh, actions in the, on the eve of rebellion. Um, 
And when he died, uh, his will required his executors to burn all the letters that he had saved from Ann Coleman. So all we have is the wrapper, but all the letters were burned. So who knows what stories were in there for the gossips. But as you know, uh, Buchanan is usually, by historians, put at the bottom of the list as the worst president in U.S. history. And uh, recently I came across uh, an historian named John Wall who wrote uh, for the American Battlefield Trust that uh, the glorious union was plunging past a collapsing compromise over slavery toward an inevitable civil war in the 1850s. So I've asked myself many times, does Buchanan really deserve um, being called the worst president? Um, what could he have done to stop the civil war at that point? said earlier, you know, the two biggest guys in the schoolyard, sooner or later they're going to fight. Um, he could have kicked the can down the road, which I guess is essentially what he did, but the South seceded not because of Buchanan, but because of the election of Abraham Lincoln. And it was Lincoln who obviously prosecuted the Civil War. I really don't see any way that Buchanan or his predecessors could have done much to... Um, stave off a bloody civil war uh, unless uh, southern slaveholders had uh, agreed to something like uh, compensated emancipation. Um, and if he had favored the South more than people like William Lloyd Garrison were talking about having the North secede. So I think Buchanan gets a, a bad rap. When he's done, we move to our probably our least obscure president, Abraham Lincoln. And that's the story of America's eight obscure presidents in 24 years. I'd be glad to answer any questions or you can throw tomatoes at me or whatever. But um, I'm sorry for not having the proper PowerPoint, but uh, thankfully we may do, I think. Yes, ma'am. Uh, at least three, I think. I think he was on the ticket, was actually nominated and ran twice, and I think there was other time. Between Clay and Webster, they fought each other, even though they were in essentially in the same party. But, uh, he was the, uh, who's the guy who ran so many times in, 18, in the 40s and 50s? I can't remember his name. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> well, I've thought of doing another lecture on the obscure presidents from Grant to William Howard Taft, and I, I haven't gotten around to that yet. Unfortunately, I can't even do them in order. But, um, Garfield or, or Harrison? It's hard to say because in one case you would have had Reconstruction, in the other case you still had slavery. And I don't know. Maybe you can ask her to give a lecture on this. <laughs> I don't know what could have been done as long as they refused to free the slaves. Even the, to, to buy the slaves would have probably cost less than the Civil War, and you wouldn't have had 800,000 people die as a result of it either. But um, it's hard for us to put ourselves back there. And 
we all know the North was just as racist as, as the South, except um, many people didn't believe in human bondage. And, uh, you know, it's, I don't know who could have resolved that. I, George Washington couldn't. Jefferson couldn't. Ad, Adams, um, you know, Jefferson, uh, I recall, wrote a letter to maybe the Lafayette saying that, uh, we know slavery's wrong, but it's it's something our generation can't resolve. I'll leave it to future generations. And both North and South believed that uh, it was up to God, and blood had to be shed in order to for God to be propitiated. I think is the word. <laughs> Sir. No nothings, the free no soilers. Yeah. I think in California once a candidate ran on the birthday party. <laughs> so maybe. It was no nothing was the American party, but when they were asked about uh, their policies and stuff, they said, we know nothing. You didn't want to be associated with them, so they'd say, I know nothing. No, they didn't. They were the American party. Oh, they were the yeah, they're, they've come to us as the know nothings because that's, rather than answering questions at press conferences and stuff, they'd say, I know nothing. You know. Yes. It's not my uh, strong suit, but let's see. Washington was a Mason, but there were people, I guess, objected religiously to the fact that the Masons were secret. And um, does anybody here a Mason who who could talk better of why there was a party? It was all wrapped up in being against foreigners, and there was anti-papists and there were you know, um, you, know you, you get into all kinds of conspiracies and uh, why they were against George Washington and other Masons I, I, it's a good thing I, I'll read that tonight while I'm watching the Eagles slaughter the Cowboys <laughs> okay well, that's it well thanks very much for your attention